Perfect. Uh, 7.35 as promised. We waited for five minutes for people to join in. They may also join in uh, in due course of time. Good evening, everyone. I welcome you all for this yet another very exciting and very interesting session of City Book Leaders. Um, a lot of thanks for joining in. Considering this is a Sunday evening, you have to be with your family or possibly over the weekend, you have spent enough time to be with your family and you find this to be a good escape out of so many days being with family and you are looking for your, some of your own time and possibly you want to uh, know about friendships that are happening uh, that have happened in the world, I must say. And today we're going to discuss about a friendship that actually changed the course of the Indian political system, the modern history of the country. That's between uh, Atal Vihari Bajpay, our former late um, uh, Prime Minister, as well as uh, Lal Krishna Advani. Um, it's a very unique session um, where we shall be discussing about the political personalities, just not them, but rather we shall be discussing the impact of their relationships on the political fabric of the country. Uh, we are here to discuss the recently launched book of Vina Sitapati, Professor Vina, Vina Sitapati with us who is here, uh, Jugal Bandi, the BJP before Modi. And I should uh, show you the book as well. It matches my jacket and there was a reason why I'm wearing <laughs> this colored jacket. I thought there should be some colors in life. We should just not do only the management books, the discussion around management books, but have something to take out management lessons out of uh, history and that to a very recent history. And especially uh, today is a very interesting day. It's the, it's the birthday of Stalin, it's the birthday of Ambedkar, 6th of December, not only because of these two birthdays, but also because um, we have uh, a very important, um, um, I should say that there has, there has been um, a relationship to this date. I was very young uh, on 6th of December, 1992. And it was my Hindi paper next day, exam the next day in my school days. And when the Babri demolition, um, uh, the demolition of Babri Masjid happened. Of course, we are not going to talk uh, much about that political aspect of the book, but yes, about various kinds of instances that have happened in the book and the impact on this relationship amongst the entire uh, system that is there now and also uh, how it happens in the present times. Uh, so today we have Professor Vinasita Pati, who is a political scientist, lawyer, and journalist. He has a PhD from Princeton University and degrees from Harvard University and the National Law School of uh, uh, India University, Bangalore. His first book, Half Lion, Narsimha, was a best-selling biography of P.V. Narsimha Rao and Sitapati teaches at uh, Ashoka University near Delhi. Professor Sitapati, we welcome you Thank to you. this session of City Book Leaders. Thank you very heard much. heard so much about your book on P.V. Narsimha Rao. In fact, I saw some of the videos as well. And one very interesting facet of Narsimha Rao that comes out where um, uh, Rudrangshu Mukherjee, he asked a question to you. Um, so whom do you think he would have been at this point of time? Why was he a loner? Because he said, you said he was always in his books. He never needed anyone else's company. And that remark actually made me actually uh, get your book and I'm about to start the book as well. That's Professor Vinay Sita Pati uh, with us. Uh, we have a very erudite gentleman who's going to be our host for the session. Um, I welcome Mr. Rohit Bansal here today. He's a media leader and influencer. He's an alum of Harvard Business School and St. Stephen's College. He's a distinguished fellow at India's premier think tank, the Observer Research Foundation, which is ORF. Rohit is a British evening scholar. Um, he's on multiple boards, Network 18, uh, has been presently serving as well as in and, and has been on multiple boards by COM18, Lokmat, um, Prisman News Broadcaster Association. He's a mentor to the Geo Next. Uh, and presently, yes, I must tell that he's presently the group communications head of Alliance uh, Industries Limited. Um, in the past, he has been with very remarkable organizations, he has been a very senior journalist himself and has uh, been on very uh, commendable assignments. Uh, people who are patrons of City Book Leaders, he would have, uh, they would have seen uh, Rohit last year while we had the privilege of hosting um, yet another uh, erudite personality uh, and also an educationalist, I must say, Rajat Gupta, last year in Delhi. And he was on the and panel. You were, and you were wearing the same jacket, by the way. No, no, no. That, was, that, was a, that was a black blazer. I must say that was not at all this colored jacket. <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> 
and the list is long when I talk about Rohit, uh, a book lover. We met through books and that too when we hosted Amitabh Bachchan. That's exactly where we met a couple of years back. So we look forward to this discussion today. Um, Professor Vinay Sitapati, you have the rights to share your screen. You may please proceed and then we will have a question and answer round uh, followed by your presentation. Thanks. Uh, I'm only going to take about seven or eight minutes because I don't want to keep you from Mr. Bansal and keep me from his questions. Um, so the book is called Jugal Bandi, the BJP before Modi. And just to give you some background about myself, um, I wrote a book on, uh, as uh, Mohit said, I wrote a book on Narsimha Rao, half line in English, Adha Sher in Hindi, translated into many languages and in many countries. Uh, so I'm interested in, in uh, contemporary history, contemporary political history but I look at it from the lens of political science and I try to find out questions like how did India change, right? Or why does the BJP win? So I, I try to fix puzzles when it comes to contemporary history and answer them. This book dealt with the question of how India changed in the 1990s. And I argued that that change was principally political and at the heart of the change was the prime minister of the day, Narsimha Rao. The current book focuses on the partnership of Atal Bihari Vajpayee and uh, Lal Krishna Advani to ask the question, what is Hindu nationalism and why does the BJP win? Given the BJP's complete dominance or near complete dominance on the national stage and competitive dominance on the state level, it's a question we all should be asking today. But my focus is on the period 1924 to 2004. I argue that it's taken 100 years to create Narendra Modi. So if you want to understand today, as well as the future, because the BJP is not going to go away anytime soon, you need to understand these first 100 years of BJP's history. Now, all of you know what Jugal Bandi means. It's a, it's a word in Hindi. But just to kind of emphasize two aspects of the word Jugal Bandi, it's a musical concert that involves two different musicians, right? This is the key, that the musicians are different from each other. It's not a duet. And second, ultimately, it's an equal music that there's, it's not that one is a soloist, the other is an accompanist. Both are equally soloists or typically soloists who perform together. It's a music, a music of different musicians and it's a music of, of equal music. And really, I look at this, the 60 year relationship between Vajpayee and Advani to tell the story of different musicians ending up playing equal music. To give you just a sense of how unique this relationship is, considering the following. All of you know that in India, we take hierarchy very seriously. I'm from a senior batch. You're from a junior batch. We do this in school. We do this in college. When we join government service also, we have a senior junior batch. And Indians are very touchy about serving under somebody who once served under them, right? Which is why, to give you a current example, it was quite remarkable of Mahinder Singh Dhoni in cricket that he once was the boss or the captain of Virat Kohli, but later on agreed to serve under Virat Kohli. That's very unusual in India. Now consider this. From 1968 to 1986, Vajpayee was the boss of the party. Advani served under him. In 1986, the RSS um, orders Vajpayee to step down as party president of the BJP. And from 1986 to 1995, it's Advani who calls the shots and Vajpayee loyally serves under him. Once again, in 1995, Vajpayee becomes the face of the BJP, the prime ministerial candidate, becomes prime minister three times in 96, 98 and 99, 99 to 2004 for five years. And in this nine year period, it's Advani who serves under Vajpayee. In India, even a single switch of hierarchy is considered exceptional. Nowhere in the world have I heard about a double switch. And really, this, this emphasis on Jugal Bandi, on working together, is, I argue, the ethos of the BJP. Now, look, the book is not, a you know, even though it's on a political topic, it's not a political book in that my job is not to tell you whether to like the BJP or hate to be the BJP. If you're a critic of Modi and you read the book, I'm not going to change your opinion. And if you're a Modi buck and you read the book, I'm not going to change your opinion. But what I'm going to do is give you facts and data that will help you give a little more deep insights into the arguments you already have. And one of them is that the BJP wins because it has an emphasis of teamwork. Do people in the BJP get along with each other? No. Do they like each other? Not necessarily. Do they agree with each other? Not always. Yet it's like one of those marriages where you find an odd couple fighting in a park, 
but you never have a divorce and that really is the heart of the argument of the book that jugalbandi is not just about vajpay and advani it's the secret sauce of the bjp it's why they win and i end the book by talking about the new jugalbandi this is amit shah modi and advani at the funeral of atal bihari vajpay in 2018 so i do ask a little bit of a question in the book how does this new jugalbandi compare to the old jugalbandi that i write about in my book um but the heart of the book remains the question why does the bjp win why is it that the bjp never or very rarely does the bjp split i show you it's not just everybody has the same ideology because they don't it's also other parties have equal ideology for example the communists or the bahujan samaj party why does the bjp win and why does the bjp rarely divorce i think the answer to the question is exactly the same so that's just a little bit of a teaser of the book um i uh, hope you or uh, get a chance to read the book after this discussion and now over to you mr bansal looking forward to your questions so well, thank you thank you professor uh without much ado and uh, praising you because uh, mohit has done quite a lot of it and i would only add to his powerful erudition uh, i want to ask you uh, straight away you know when a person buys this book as i did uh, you see this you see this image of mr vajpay and mr adwani looking at each other and that sounds like a fairly relevant uh, point of view but when you flip the book uh, they are looking away uh surely this is not out of the same uh, uh, function because in this one is sitting to each other's right and left respectively and this flip means that this is not exactly an image from the same uh, occasion except that it is a manipulation of uh, of uh, the, the the visual so uh, in earnestness and politeness i just want to say uh, is there a forced uh, idiom that you have used to force an argument around selling a very deep uh, historical context and uh, just putting personalities up front and making them face each other in one and looking away from each other even though they weren't oh not at all not at all it's actually the opposite so the the argument of the book is a deep one which is that the bjp doesn't split and it doesn't split it's not because they like each other so the sort of the point of putting it like this is to tell you that you know as i as i mentioned in the book that relationship has ups and downs so for example between 1986 and 1995 vajpay does feel marginalized so that's a story here right there is marginalization vajpay does get hurt vajpay does complain about advani vajpay does oppose the rath yatra in 1990 he tells advani that if you get on top of the tiger you know uh, you, you you the problem is you can't get down and once again between um, uh, 2000 1998 and 2004 when vajpay and advani are in power vajpay is prime minister and advani eventually becomes deputy prime minister there's a lot of tension in that political marriage right uh you know as as a senior journalist who covered that period you'd know all the stories right of one camp leaking about the other camp you know issues accusations and the core issue there was that vajpay felt that advani was a great party man but he wasn't a competent minister and he trusted brajesh mishra his principal secretary much more so in that sense the point of that photograph is exactly right which is that that relationship has had ups and downs and that ups and downs is true they have had professional tension they have had personal tension at the same time they have also been friendly they also watch bollywood films they eat pani puri together so the the book chronicles the ups and downs of that relationship right the point of the book or the argument of the book is a deep one which is that despite ups and downs the bjp doesn't split the bjp the the, the if to give you just one example when vajpay was a sideline during the 1986 to 1995 or 1993 radical phase of the bjp he was sideline right he opposed the ayodhya movement he opposed the rath yatra he opposed the demolition of the babri masjid and i show here that congress leaders came fishing told vajpay please join us right and had because they thought they would get the hindu votes because of vajpay without alienating muslims and vajpay says no and when journalist asks him during that period he says jaye bhi to jaye kahan right so he has the opportunity and had he left mr bansal i can, i can say with some confidence of course it's a counterfactual we never know that it would be have been the very hard for the bjp in 96 to find the coalition allies certainly advani wouldn't have been able to find the coalition allies for the bjp to form a stable government uh, in 98 you know to 2004 
So there was an opportunity to break it. They don't break it, right? Equally, when Advani feels sidelined in government between 98 to 2004, I show you that there, were, there was a big tension happening between the RSS and Vajpayee during that period. Had Advani taken the RSS aside, the Vajpayee government would have become very weak. Vajpayee would have become very weak. He may well have been forced to resign. He doesn't do it. So in that sense, that the, the relationship is at the key. At a second level, if you want to understand the BJP before Modi, you have to understand the relationship. So to understand the, the, the movement, you have to understand the relationship for two reasons. One is that, um, all, you know, as I point out, the birth of these two takes place in the birth of Hindu nationalism, which is the 1920s. From basically 1957 to 2007, right, 50 years, Vajpayee is the face of the movement in parliament. And from 1968 to basically in 2007, between Vajpayee and Advani, they completely control the party, right? Um, completely, right? They, it changes a little bit when they come to government. You have Venkaya Naidu, but even then it's Vajpayee and Advani who are calling the shots. There's a brief period, two-year period, where Murli Manohar Joshi is the president of the party, but the two of them gang up to very quickly eject him, right? So between 91 and 93. So at a second, so one is that the photograph correctly tells you that it's a relationship of ups and downs, right? Oh, but Second, this, this photograph uh, yes. never happened. And no, obviously, you are a journalist, you have been, a, you are an academic, you'll appreciate that on the cover of a book, you don't put a manipulated design oriented photograph. No, you're absolutely, like you're absolutely wrong in that, Mr. Bansal. Firstly, you're incorrect on your facts because the back photo is the right photo. So if you had done your research, you'd know that this is the right photo, right? So the right photo is one of tension. And the, 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 this photo is the artificial photo, right? Now it's the same. Either way, either way. No, 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 wait. Now the, both these photos, wait, 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 let me finish. You asked a question. Now, anyone who reads this book, Mr. Bansal, and I trust the participants of this, knows that it's the same photo. There is not, that, suppose I had only shown you this photo, right? Mm. Then you'd say, no, it's, it's an artificial, but I deliberately put this, which is the original photo. And it's exactly the same photo that everybody reading it knows it's exactly the same thing. It's there's, there's no, there's no question about it. And as a journalist, I know very well that I trust the reader enough to know that they know that this is exactly the same photo twice. And I, I trust them somehow. You don't seem to trust the reader to understand that the deeper point made that in some sense, the, the pluses and the minuses of that relationship was artificially kept together. That is the key, right? When you have a, uh, you know, you have so many marriages in India, you know, famous line of Ashish Nandi, that 70% of marriages in India, you know, um, um, uh, couples in India are divorced, they just don't know it, right? That's a little bit like that, that at many times it is ideology that kept them together. And that's, that's really the point of, of the book. I mean, I'd be surprised if you think, I mean, you know, you're probably the only person who thinks that readers will object that the same photo is used twice and that's an act of manipulation. If so long as you say the same photo has been used twice. Uh, with this I article, mean, <laughs> it's totally between you and your publishers. I thought I should just make this uh, submission that uh, uh, it is, it is a, a kind of a forced flip, but so to speak. It's a I mean, but it's an, but Mr. Bansal to repeat, it's an obvious forced flip. It's literally the same photo that has been flipped. Like which reader won't notice that it's not, you're not making a insightful point on that. So it's, uh, it's pretty obvious to any reader, right? I vouch for it. I vouch for it, Mr. Sitavati. Yes, it is. <laughs> I mean, what, what part of this is not obvious, Mr. Bansal? Good, good. Since uh, you have a uh, Mohit's casting vote, I'll let it be and let the readers decide. Uh, I was also intrigued by staying on your powerful cover and the color matching uh, Mr. Uh, Mohit Gupta's jacket or the jacket matching the color. Jugal Bandi. Now, it is not un, uh, usual for an English book and a very beautifully written book, an argument where people may agree or disagree is another matter, to be having a Hindi name. Like you wrote half line and now other share is fine, but you didn't write other share, right? Uh, it may have also, uh, to, to the literally, literary incline, uh, uh, sounded like Ghalib writing one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Other so yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, humor, uh, attempt at humor apart. Jugal Bandi, why did you think of uh, a title which was in another language? Instead, would you have thought of also or played with uh, equal music? Of course, Mr. Vikram Seth may not have liked it very much. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. but what what is it in, in your thought process or the publisher that put you guys into the 
Hindi word at the cover of a, of a beautifully written English book. Well, you know, we thought about it for a long time. So, right, so one title we had actually, Mr. Bansal, was First Bloom, because it's the first bloom of the lotus, right? Um, we thought of duet, right, which is another musical allusion. But, you know, both equal music and duet did not talk about difference. Like the heart of what the relationship made it work was different. They were different from each other. And yet somehow they were able to make music. So we spent actually, you know, I think right from the beginning when the book was, when I was working on the book, which is three years ago, I, we spent time, you know, thinking of different titles. We were definitely worried about Jugalbandi because anyone who speaks English in India knows Jugalbandi intuitively, but what about a foreign audience, right? Yes. So we were thinking about that, but this book in, uh, when it's released in UK and US, uh, will have a different title, right? Oh, okay. And um, they, they prefer that anyway. And we sort of, we said that, look, one is there's no translation for Jugalbandi in English, right? And intuitively, when you, when I tell people, look, this is a book on Vajpayee and Advani and it's a Jugalbandi, everybody kind of got it, even if they couldn't articulate because the point, like, these were different people, right? Now you can say moderate hardliner, you know, you can say one was the organizer, the other is the orator, one is outgoing, the other is a little more introvert, but that these were not, this was an odd couple, right? So we could have used the word odd couple, right? But uh, we just felt that English readers or people who read in English in India uh, intuitively know what Jugalbandi means. And, and I hope that it kind of catches on. Of course, in the US and UK, uh, what you're saying is absolutely right. So I hope that we, um, uh, you know, it will be definitely a different title. So while on backstories, you know, uh, I assume that some readers have gone through the book and they'll have an opinion which more its questions might reflect later in the evening. Uh, there will be others who are just plain curious. But I thought I should use uh, our time as uh, those who have some training in history to really go behind and see the historian or the contemporary historian at that. So tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, which... Uh, uh, you know, persuaded you to become an author, uh, which uh, pushed you out of uh, writing on an area in which you trained, for example, in politics per se, though, of course, there are huge and erudite traces of politics in your book, uh, also law. Uh, so fundamentally, uh, who is Vinay Sitapati? Uh, tell us from the beginning to uh, maybe 25 years or 30 years old that you are probably. <laughs> well, I wish I'm unfortunately 37, but I, I would take that as a compliment. Well, one is I'm technic I'm a political scientist. So this book is a work of political science in that, unlike, look, I deal with political history, but I'm interested in causation. I'm interested in why, right? I'm interested in marshalling evidence for, you know, is the answer this or is the answer that? Historians don't like that. They find that when you take history and you try to make it into like a science, you know, about why did X happen? Why did BJP rise? They find it's, it's quite limiting. So it's a difference in approach and many of the scholars that I refer so did to. You, you all, have it, uh, did you have it well before you became an academic? Did you, uh, is there some instance in your childhood or yeah, in yeah, yeah. formative years which led you to become this kind of a questioning type? <laughs> no, I think what uh, in my case is that even though, as I said, technically it's a book of political science, all my life I've resisted this label. So if somebody calls me a historian, I'm comfortable with it. If somebody calls me a lawyer, I'm comfortable with it. Though I'm not a, I mean, I have a law degree, but I haven't really practiced, you know, so I wouldn't. But if somebody says lawyer, I'm fine. Because what I realized, Mr. Bansal, is that in the world of intellectual or knowledge production, we spend a lot of time tagging or categorizing ourselves, right? Yeah. And instead, what we should do is tag or categorize the reader. So what is the kind of book the reader wants to know, hear, read? And what is the kind of evidence we should marshal for the reader? To me, that has always been the first question rather than, look, so for example, you know, um, I've studied law. So um, I use a lot of legal analysis in this book to give you one question, who killed Mahatma Gandhi, right? I have three or four pages on that. It's a very sensitive question, right? Was the RSS involved? And I tell you, I show you here, the institutions of the RSS wasn't involved, but Godse had once been a member of the RSS was a member of the splinter group of the Hindu Mahasabha and, and shared the criticisms that the RSS had of Mahatma Gandhi. But that doesn't mean the RSS advocated violence. But that's a very fine line. And unless I'm a lawyer who's able to read the judgments, read between the lines, look at various witnesses and kind of come up with, with what I think is the correct judgment on the issue, um, it, you know, in some sense, it misleads the reader. So um, I, I definitely, you know, and again, doing so doesn't make this a legal book, right? It just makes, so to me, all these different things I did were 
skills that i picked up that could be used rather than identities that you know i'm going to tell myself now i'm a lawyer or now i'm a political scientist or historian i think from a very early age i like to read um i like to and i was interested in contemporary politics like i'm a child mr bansal of the 1990s so growing up the big big question plaguing my or the big political questions was liberalization i remember seeing the first mcdonalds open in bombay where i'm from Uh, i remember standing in line there and in some sense the narsimha rao book was to answer that bigger question that liberalization that change that i saw in my family in the 90s didn't just happen there was a political story there and equally the other big story in the 90s is the story of uh, rise of bjp and so i began intuitively when it came to um, um uh, studying vajpayee that i said first i'll study vajpayee right and then i realized very quickly that you can't study vajpayee without studying advani so in that sense the book has a very organic feel so then i said it's a vajpayee advani story but then i realized that look the bjp has historically had jugalbandis previously it has had for example shama prashad mukherjee and dindyal upadhyay at the origins and there's something about this movement that requires an orator and an organization and an organizer and in that sense vajpayee and advani though remarkable politicians in their own right but also playing a role right and they were carefully social engineered by someone like dindyal upadhyay to play this role i guess where i'm i'm getting at to your your question is that i like it to be intuitive right rather than going in with a plan because then that's not research like if you already know what you're going to do then and the reader mr bansal can smell this the reader knows very quickly whether i'm trying to sell the reader something whether i have an angle whether i'm trying to kind of fool the reader and the reader has enormous power over me because a reader will do this and read the book and then suddenly close the book and put it down and there's nothing i can't argue with the reader anymore right so i've always been interested in in writing in reading but i've also kind of followed my instinct and even with the book i kind of follow the evidence organically rather than go in and thopo my particular argument because readers figure that out very quickly i have uh, i can uh, confirm this and i we, we won't need more its casting vote for a change <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, in the 85 or odd pages of notes that you have given at the back of your book and that's kind of uh, unusual except ram guha who gives more notes and yeah. thicker books yeah, and yeah, you yeah. refer to him as well as pratap yeah. banu mehta on the other yeah. end of the uh, spectrum yeah. uh, it struck me that uh, Uh, you have been able to talk to uh, people who would find it hard to be in the same room, at least ideologically. Uh, and uh, considering there are two hundred plus interviews, and I went into the detail, and since I know some of them uh, without naming them, uh, I think it is quite an interesting uh, uh, ensemble of counter narratives which you have uh, probably uh, got inside your uh, head before you got down to it. So since you assure us that you. Uh, jumped into the project without having a one line edit uh, yes, story yes, line yes, yes. and that uh, uh, would it be fair to ask you whether um, uh, you vote bjp oh no that's a private question so i don't answer that i've been asked this before right i don't answer that but i can see why people might think so when they read the book not because it's a pro bjp book for example on the godra violence you know i don't shy away just to give you one post godra violence uh, in gujarat but the aim of the book is not the typical denunciation of the bjp or a hagiography of the bjp that's not the aim the it's aim neither. of this is why it is a very sophisticated it's and neither. i would i would say bipartisan narrative yeah. woven into something yeah. with lots of uh, very well written uh, yeah. uh, you know uh, and you know and to give you and one example <laughs> yeah and to give you one example you know swarajya which is a center right magazine gave it a great review wire which is a left magazine or scroll you know have sort of dealt with the book well because what i wanted to do and look it was really difficult to take such a heated political topic and to reduce your blood pressure right that's what i want i didn't want you to come out reading this book feeling angry Right. I was. I have been able to get interviews with Swapan Das Gupta and with Ram Guha. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, there are examples like you cited about yeah. Swaraj yeah. and why. So, uh, is it something that you uh, uh, you feel is a is an asset in today's India or a liability where uh, writers are typically boxed, uh, whether uh, publications are typically boxed into uh, type. and then the rest of it starts and uh, then the audiences also migrate towards either 
Yeah. So let's start with the audience here. Do you think there is an audience for a genuine uh, middle path, both sides of the story put together in an anecdotal, uh, engaging way? I think that's a tough question to answer, Mr. Bansal. I would like to believe there is, right? But for the reasons that you mentioned, one must look at reality. I mean, I think, you know, what Mohit is doing and others are doing, encouraging, you know, the reading of books rather than just looking at an incendiary tweet um, is a step in the right direction. But look, it's an uphill battle because let's just take Twitter. There's just such an, you know, if you're a reasoned, you know, uh, uh, tweet on Twitter doesn't get you any retweets. You have to say the most outrageous thing on the right or the left to, you know, that's the, that's what social media has done. And I, my bet is that, you know, pe there will be a group of people irritated with this, right? But I'm under no illusions that I'm swimming against the tide of history for the reasons that you mentioned. And it's a deep problem. It's not, I mean, I try and, um, you know, um, so far, at least for this book, I've, I've stood on the tightrope without being like heckled on Twitter on either side, but that could change. And, uh, it's, 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 it's a very difficult environment for what you're suggesting. It's a very difficult environment, you know? Yeah. And also with waning attention spans and yeah. more time we spent on a small screen. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, books by per se and Mohit's, uh, uh, you know, it's not a commercial for Mohit, but genuine appreciation from both yeah. of us here that efforts such as these uh, need to be encouraged, even though, uh, you know, uh, ironically they are on social media yeah. and yeah. platforms can be, uh, uh, a convergence point for people of varied interests, including yeah. those for the long read. Yeah. So uh, let me uh, segue this into uh, the other part of the notes, my favorite part, because they kind of uh, go beyond the, uh, sometimes I would furiously jump and say, why has he said it and how has he said it? And there are at least uh, 20, 25 notes to each of your chapters. It struck me as well as a, uh, as a you know, um, as historiography here, uh, for those of us who are not trained in history, uh, the rationale and the source material is what we are talking about. Uh, in chapter one, for example, out of say 25 notes, almost 20 are mainstream journalism notes. Yes. They are cited from uh, magazines and newspapers, yes. which yes. many of us would you know, wonder whether uh, yeah. they should be the primary sources, at least yeah, yeah. Uh, those of us who trained yeah. uh, uh, in the mid 80s, yes, yes, when yes, you were yes, still, uh, you know, uh, yes, yes. enjoying your McDonald's uh, yes, burger. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, some of us uh, were told that give it like 30, 40 years, 50 years. In fact, yeah. Vipan Chandra and, uh, you know, Satish Chandra and even yeah. Romila Ji, they would just stop at 1947 yeah. or yeah. even earlier yeah. and not go into, you know, this uh, the, the, the era there. After. Yeah, yeah. Of course, Rango has changed it a little bit yeah, and yeah, very yeah. serious histories are being written closer yeah. and closer to 2014, such as yourselves. But uh, I'm just kind of wondering whether it is the paucity of uh, written uh, uh, papers by uh, uh, the, uh, the dramatist persona yeah. that somehow uh, st uh, stopped becoming very important in the India of the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s in yeah. your case. Because yeah. if you see the corpus that the leaders of our freedom movement left behind, each yeah. one of them, yeah. Nehru, uh, Gandhi, uh, Patel, uh, they are uh, treasure houses. Yeah. Now, in this case, you are clearly uh, uh, left to, uh, you know, uh, looking for the dregs from journalistic sources, Virinder yeah. Kapoor, Kumi Kapoor, you mentioned a few of them. Uh, I wonder if uh, where anecdotal starts taking over yeah. and just citing them is the last yeah. resort yeah. as opposed yeah. to a serious private correspondence yeah. Yeah. that you don't seem to have had access because it probably didn't exist. Yeah. No, I, well, I'll push back a little bit because that the book has 1800 footnotes, right? Mm -hmm. Of which uh, uh, I would say maybe uh, you know, 800 or so will be journalistic sources. But the, the remaining, which are not journalistic sources, are still more than anyone else. The reason why journalism is, becomes important is for two reasons. One is when you're doing contemporary history, right? It gives you what a witness thought that day, which is what I think is quite important, right? And Ram Goha uses them. And I've learned to use, uh, for, to give you one example, Times of India has archives from the late 19th century, right? The, which is, of course, available online. You have to pay for it. Hindu, again, has archives since the late 19th century. What, what these archives gives you, however, 
is a flavor of what happened in the day. It doesn't give you anything larger than that. But it tells you that was Atal Bihari Vajpayee wearing a, what was the color of his kurta, right? Now, you can't rely on newspaper sources for arguments. So there, as I've done in the book, I've looked at 200 articles and books, right, which I cite copiously for the arguments. Or, you know, the private correspondences I mentioned of ML Ghatate, who's a um, yeah. lawyer of, uh, of Vajpayee and Advani, ML Sondhi, who was kind of a, you know, an initially I think successful. Not just that. I think Ghatate Sahib was also an insider who chose never to speak to journalists. Yes, yes, that. yes. But he Bar carries mind. the flame of Vajpayee. You're exactly right. Or someone like ML Sondhi, who has, you know, private Pron, papers. The, the prawn parties, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, or for, or for example, if you look at Hindu Mahasabha papers, you know, if you go to the Nehru Memorial, I looked at that uh, a, a lot. You get the entire Hindu Mahasabha archives, right? Or V.D. Savarkar's archives, again, in Delhi, they are available. But what I decided to do was that if you have to give that color, if you have to give that detail, right? I found newspapers to be very good for that, right? What you can't take from newspapers sometimes is an evidence of a larger argument, right? So, for example, uh, just to give you one, another example, you know, I spend a lot of energy looking at the rise of the BJP in the 1980s, right? Now you can get, you know, for example, if, if you have to look at um, the number of, of, of people killed in Hindu Muslim violence, you shouldn't just look at newspapers. So there is, I rely on a data set, Vashni Wilkinson data set, which is able to provide that. But as a former journalist myself, I'm very proud of the work, especially reporters do to give you the color and the flavor of, of that particular day, especially if it's like to give you another example. I want to transport, you mentioned the first chapter, which is really the 1910s and the 20s, right? Now, yeah, I can, of course, tell you the, you know, go to the archives and tell you the, uh, you know, how much did the Hindu Mahasabha win, how much did the Congress party win. But I want to also transport the reader to that day, right? They're going to Times of India or Hindu or, you know, another newspaper with a reporter writing what happened in 1911, right? Uh, that I find, you know, um, gives it the color and the flavor and, and sort of transports you to that world. So I'm a big fan of, um, of the use of journalism, especially in contemporary history. You have to be careful what you use it for. So you have to use it for reportage or for the first cut rather for any larger argument. And if you're using any data from a journalist, you should verify from independent sources. Well, I do hope that you write a sequel and uh, <laughs> the sequel doesn't rest on journalism alone because uh, there may be people who will wonder whether the journalism that is uh, available to us uh, is able to capture 2014 and thereafter with any degree of uh, agreement on, on what happened when. They're almost two opposite uh, uh, counterpoints that we have seen and the schism is only getting deeper. Yeah, but you know, I think, that, you know, uh, in the 1920s was a period of enormous schism in India. I think with the benefit of hindsight, we think that, you know, yesterday's politics was very relaxed and today's politics is quite polarizing. Mm -hmm. But like to give you an example, the 1980s, I find to be an extraordinarily polarizing decade in India. Extraordinary, right? And the 1920s again, is an extraordinary polarizing. And you know, if you looked at newspapers there, you looked at political parties there, you would imagine that it looks a little like India today. You know, it's as polarized, it's as, you know, as vicious, the kind of religious, for, to give you one example, the communal violence data on the 1920s and 1980s is quite astonishing, right? Hindu Muslim tensions are, are really burst out. And here you have like the, literally the best data that political scientists make on, on the subject. So I, you know, I do feel that, you know, we have, if we just, we constantly imagine that the present is far more uh, anger prone, right? Than, than the past. That's not really true. And the other way to look at it is that maybe the present isn't this anger prone, right? Maybe the present isn't this polarized. And maybe, you know, to answer the question that you said earlier, there's a, there is a little bit of a space um, for reasoned debate, which exactly the kind of Mohit uh, thing Mohit does, even in today's context. So that definitely, if I look at the past, that way it definitely gives me hope. Good. That's a that's a very uh, buoyant uh, and uh, I know it is not a very uh, good uh, metric to look at Twitter follows or Twitter retweets because uh, uh, if serious folks like you you also should uh, uh, you know uh, agree that uh, somebody who used it rather well uh, uh, doesn't necessarily need to be taken that seriously. Uh, the White House uh, 
uh, incumbent is a good No, example. but anyone who ever wants to write a biography of Trump has to deal with his tweets, has to look at his tweets. And, you know, anyone, Mr. Bansal, you or Mohit, if a future biographer has to look at your emails, has to look at, this is the, you know, as our communication begins, you know, you asked the question earlier about, let, you know, letters and we've lost the art of letter writing. Indians and people across the world communicate a lot. The Donald Trump communicates a lot. And that those tweets change the world. So we, and that's the thing I realized a lot. And this is the last question, Mohit, and I want to take questions, um, which is that as an academic or as a researcher, I have to go with the evidence of the time, right? So sure. definitely in 20 years, people will start looking at email correspondences, Twitter, you know, and with all the problems that that entails, right? Bad spelling, you're really not saying what you're saying, you're trying to inflame yourself. But this is also the case when, you know, for, to give you an example, uh, you know, you, you're a student of history, you look, you know, we look at those Ashoka inscriptions, right? To for mm -hmm. a, to decipher the politics of the period. That is straight up hagiography is written by Ashoka about himself, right? So we should take it with as much a pinch of salt as we take a lot of these official newspapers today, who claim to be independent, but only parrot a particular kind of view. So history has always had this. So it's not that, you know, now I, I can guarantee you that now we are entering the age of historians and political scientists who are going to use social media as, as evidence, right? And I'm like all power to them. Like the Ash Ashoka inscription was a form of Twitter then. Now we have actu actual Twitter. So, you know, I'm, I'm that way. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm proud of the fact that I kind of leave those disciplinary constraints when reality also changes, you know? Yeah, so they will be good source material, but you shouldn't bother if your uh, own tweets are not retweeted is my point. <laughs> they are two different audiences. So source yeah. material by, by yeah. from Twitter is perfectly valid yeah. to the yeah. illustration we made together. Yeah. But uh, worrying too much about how many have uh, used uh, your serious essay on Trump uh, yeah. will not necessarily be the right metric out here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, all power to you and a good interpretation of contemporary sourcing. And of course, bringing it closer and closer. So uh, is that the way Mohit would want us to uh, now leave it to him and the audience? Yes, sir. I think we have a good number of questions also coming in. But before we take forward, one thing, uh, Professor Sita Bhati, I would like to mention from your book, which actually um, is the gist of the book, me per se, is when um, Bajpayee enters his room and he sees that Nehru's photo has been removed. And he asks the secretary why it has been removed. Of course, flattery is always there. And he puts the photo back. And I think that's one example that sets the tone. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting Atul Bihari Bajpayee. Um, one of my board examinations, I was supposed to, I was, I was going and I had to meet him and take Ashirwad for my Hindi paper, I must say. <laughs> Though my marks were not definitely so good. But yes, and I think that's one reason why he was also respected very well in his circles. Uh, even today, people uh, do remember him for whatever good he did in terms of his attitude, attributes. Uh, that's a brilliant uh, subject that you have brought in. And also about the Atma Vilopan as a theory of uh, the entire group, which is that's exactly right. That's exactly resolving right. self uh, and putting yourself um, uh, beyond, uh, uh, actually, the, the cause is more important while whatever you act. And that's a very, very important. In fact, recently we hosted a session on the ethos of RSS and how is that an organization? And in fact, we have a question as well that has RSS and BJP always been together? And your book is definitely the answer, and especially to people like us who have been in the McDonald's line at that time. <laughs> For us, everything is one thing. You know, there are yeah. hundred plus organizations uh, who may be called um, fascist, who may be called uh, very Hindu centric or anything per se, but they are very different. They really don't have any connection per se. And that's where I think the primary research of reading multiple um, subjects do come handy yeah, yeah. rather than making your opinion, just reading a book uh, might not help. So you have to pick yeah. up multiple uh, yeah. Sub yeah. books around that. So yeah. without much of ado, I'll pick up a few of the questions um, um, and I will, um, uh, I will pick them as, um, as they have come. The first question that I will ask you is from Garima uh, Gulati. She's asking a question. It's a very interesting discussion, completely enjoying myself. But my question is, what is uh, Mr. Sita Pati's favorite part of the book? She wants to know from you, what is it that out of all the sections that you have written, which one did you enjoy the most? Well, certainly the I can tell you that the part that I know readers enjoy the most is the chapter called Spectre of Narendra Modi. 
because it sort of it shows you the causes for the rapid rise of narendra modi from a nobody right who suddenly because of a sequence of events the gujarat earthquake of 2001 or uh, around that time um, keshubai patel's failed leadership you know the um, vhp pushing for you know uh, um, um, movement on the ayodhya temple all of this i happen and within a year he is hindu hriday samrat right and i show through the book how that chapter how that causes a wedge between the already tense relationship between vajpay and advani and in some sense that that is the end of an era even though it doesn't happen immediately it takes its while but that shows the sort of the rise of modi and amit shah and the, and the gradual fading out of vajpay and advani but you know if you ask me my personal chapter was the first one or the, the the i have a prologue but the first one was it's called hindu fevi call where it took me a lot of time because you know i here's the thing right that i know that most people are reading this book because they're interested in the bjp today right so my job is if i have to give you the bitter medicine of history of arguments i have to put a little bit of honey in it so i had to write that chapter which is basically the rise and origin of hindu nationalism from the ninth from really the early 20th century until um, about 1946 right compress it into 30 pages tell you sort of the core arguments that the book is going to show so for example one argument that the book is centered around is how important elections is to hindu nationalism right they you know the if you know many of your viewers will will know that just a few days ago in the hyderabad municipal elections a star cast of bjp leaders from yogi adityanath to amit shah went for a municipal election this doesn't make sense unless you realize that for a hundred years they have been obsessed with creating a hindu majority in order to win elections right so i had to do all this and make what is not a boring argument but what is a kind of a deep argument without in the first chapter itself sort of pushing readers away you know so that was really hard because once you know in the first chapter itself if you're getting all this you'll say bhai main to modi ke liye pad raha tha aur mujhe you're telling you're giving me a history lesson so how do i actually tell that and and give a little bit of color give a little while still te- you know telling you that look there is this deep argument so that that tension which is you know i would say the tension that i have as both an academic as well as a former journalist that really you know um, that was a hard balancing act to do in that chapter so i would say the hindu fevi call chapter because it was a very difficult chapter that i had to make pleasant you know so i would say that's my personal favorite the other one that i like is it's a chapter called the um the the fire that forged the partnership which is how vajpay uh, is in competition with balraj madhok to inherit dindyal upadhyay's mantle and how in doing that he forms his partnership with advani right so that again had to be a that's a pretty delicate chapter because it's in some sense it's the beginning of the jugalbandi at least the professional jugalbandi right yes that's exactly where it started and garima is part of our history club discussions as well so i'm sure we'll pick this book as as a very recent history to be discussed and which also shows us the mirror in the future now i will this is the season of jugal mandi so i will actually combine two questions today one is by anil and the other one is by smriti i'll combine these two questions they are similar but still slightly different so um, uh, i will uh, narrate it in my own way uh, while you have mentioned about modi and amit shah's jugal mandi you have actually ended the book like this um 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 and that's how anil wants to put it and smriti mentions it uh, how does the vajpayee advani relationship compare to that in terms of hierarchy and disagreements in the formation of the present day bjp and i think you have given a elaborate discussion around it in fact the entire book ends as if this is what you wanted to conclude that we should just not build our perceptions based on what has happened in the past everyone is different every relationship is different and the best quote was that what has happened between bajpay and advani where they switched roles the possibility here in this jugal bandi is slightly difficult but we'll be who knows what the future holds right who knows because see right now you have to see this that modi and amit shah bring home the votes so everything is now beautiful right why should the rss complain why should the kadar complain why should the other bjp leaders complain when the when, when modi and amit shah are doing what the central purpose of hindu nationalism is which is to win elections right i think we'll able to see the test of this relationship right mm-hmm. when the going gets tough which is you know in in 1984 um, you know as, as since you read the book mohit you know that the bjp is reduced to two seats right yes. and now how does the jugalbandi react now how does the rss react now how does the marriage you know so i think we are still in a in a phase where 
uh, Modi and Amit Shah in, are in their political honeymoon, right? Let little bit of cracks begin in the marriage, and then we'll see how the Jugalbandi reacts under that stress. And I think we can very well compare it to a corporate situation, and Rohit will also agree. Till the time things are going well, uh, the balance sheet is fine. Things are always fine. Nobody questions about anything. But only when the pressure comes, you have to retaliate. Your your actual challenge comes out. Uh, there's a question that, in fact, there's a series of questions by Satyavadi. Uh, he is asking a couple of questions, and I, I'm presuming that he has already read the book because one of the questions actually mentions a very important term from your book, and you mentioned about Godre as well. He's asking, was there any other PM than Atal ji who told his or her CM to follow the Raj Dharma? Um, I think some of the CMs actually uh, used it uh, to instigate kind of stuff, which is not many times required as well. <laughs> Well, I, I can certainly tell you that someone like Indira Gandhi did a lot more than tell the CMs that. <laughs> I mean, you know, she had this concept of nominated chief ministers, where she used to replace chief ministers at will. In fact, one of the points I show here is that even though Atal Bihari Vajpayee is so popular and he wants Modi to go after the 2002 riots, he's not able to do it, right? So he's setting the grounds by saying Raj Dharma. He's doing all that, but ultimately he bows down before the party, right? And that tells you the kind of teamwork you have in the organization. Whereas, you know, Indra Gandhi classically, you know, there was no question of Indra Gandhi brooking dissension from a mere chief minister, right? And it shows you, and look, I'm also critical of the BJP. I, I show that it's othering of Muslims, you know, goal is part of his DNA from the 1920s itself. Just like the fact that it's a progressive Hindu party to lower caste is also part of its DNA. So I show all that, but I do mention this re relentless positive of the period that I write about, right? Which is that Jugalbandi is an organizational ethic, right? And that, ex you know, the, the, that even though Vajpayee demands Raj or, or, or requests Rajadharma of Modi, ultimately he has to back down when it comes to the continuation of Modi. And that is a, and, and he backed down for a pretty obvious reason that the Kader supported Modi, right? I think that was a need of the art. There's a very interesting question and this is slightly deep in terms of this philosophy as well. It's by Kasa Prasad, if I can take the name, because we have stopped anonymous questions. The RSS BJP combine has always been there, right? The combination that Jugal Bandi is always there. But BJP was never so formidable. There is no doubt about the amazing Modi Shah combination, the Jugal Bandi that you mentioned in the book as well. But he's asking, what is the percentage of the success which should be contributed to the failure of the INC to put up a show? That's a very good question. So that is actually a very, very good question. It's a deep question. And I, I try to answer that in the book, but only in the period I'm writing about, which is the first bloom of the BJP, which is the rise of the BJP in the 1980s, right? The first, the precondition to the rise of the BJP was definitely the slow decline of the Congress party beginning in 1967. But really the decline begins in the 1980s, right? Now the question is, and that is the political science question I ask is that even though the Congress was in decline, it was no means for sure that it would be the BJP that would replace the Congress, right? In fact, the first party that replaced the Congress was, the, was some form of Janta party, right? Or some kind of middle caste peasantry across North India. Um, I, so that was the first party that actually replaced the Congress in terms of ideology, right? Or the idea of Jai Prakash Narayan. In the 80s itself, you have some other parties that are being formed. You have the Bahujan Samaj party that is being formed, right? It is a majoritarian ideology, which is based on uniting non upper caste together, which are about 80% of the population. Uh, you have the communists, right, who are also in, you know, in some sense, appealing to the majority, which is peasants and workers. So of all these majoritarian ideas that could have replaced the Congress in the 80s, why is it that the BJP wins, right? And I don't want to tell you more because the book uh, details the sequence, yeah. right? Yeah. From a demand, you know, anxiety of Hindus to the role of RSS, then Congress, then the BJP. But definitely a cutting edge that the BJP has is that under stress, they don't split, they don't divorce, right? Whereas if you look at Kashiram itself, he has this grand pan-Indian idea. But ultimately, because he favors only one of his deputies, which is Mayavati, BSP today is the party of one caste in one state in India, right? Which is Mayavati's Jatav caste in one state that is Uttar Pradesh, right? So of course, there are many other factors that are fueling the rise of the BJP. Um, Congress decline is one of them, but it doesn't explain among all the competitors to the Congress's vote bank. Why is it that the BJP won? 
but thank you that's a very good question you know and you've definitely got into many of the core core things about the book because i spend a lot of time asking exactly this kind of question right and in fact that's exactly the message that your book also gives rather than considering it to a political book yeah i will still take out few lessons and that's what i have made in my notes so if you have dedicated 30 pages to your notes possibly i given two pages to my notes of course in my yeah, bad yeah. i must say it's yeah. a, Uh, this is a very interesting question that uh, Trambak Sinha is asking, and in fact, we can take two, three more questions. Uh, we we usually keep it sixty minutes, but considering we have some questions and they are of relevance, this one Trambak Sinha is asking: How media and marketing, media and marketing, and especially after um, uh, reading the book, how to win elections in India? <laughs> that's an interesting plot. How media and marketing help BJP and friendship with industries to win over the masses from the booth level? and you have mentioned the friendships in your book very well yeah well so you know i don't know about the modi period right and i should be honest what i've worked on i can tell you which is 1924 to 2004 from 2004 onwards or 2014 onwards i know as much as anybody else i don't have any special insight but what i realized in the first bloom of the bjp which is the first government formed under the bjp is that it's not that me- you have media and corporates in your pocket mm-hmm. and elections follow and and electoral success follows it's usually the other way around right which is as you begin to succeed electorally right media and corporates begin to come towards you so i show you that in the for example the 60s uh, you know the 50s and the 60s because the congress was reigning no corporate would want to be seen as paying for the jansang which is the precursor party for the BJ- for, for the bjp they found it very hard to access the media right now cut to um, nine, in the mid 90s or early 90s when the bjp is coming within striking distance of power suddenly the corporates giving money to the party begins to change right so to me it's a little bit at least in the period that i'm looking at and again this is the political scientist in me which is why i'm saying that this is you know not what historians do which is to ask did the horse come first or the cart come first right now political scientists obsess about this question which is which way does the arrow go right um and for me at least in the period that i am writing about the bjp first became popular electorally and then got media and um and and corporate power right um because corporates also not fools they obviously would like to back the um, the winning horse in india they don't want to be seen to back the losing horse right which is also why you see the situation of the congress what it is today right in fact very much in your book you have actually mentioned and uh, rohit would have also noticed this point that the placement of modi at a time when the number of seats were very low and i think that's where you need a maverick to come in who can actually balance out both the sides with a common ideology and that's like common vision that you to follow there's a very interesting question by our common friend of rohit and i shrinath he's asking a question is there any similar jugalbandi or the pairing in politics in india and abroad if yes you can comment on personality type differences with the protagonist protagonist you have written about well so i can think very immediately within india of the communist party of india which like the bjp is both a movement aiming to change society right as well as a party aiming to seek power so it's both right so that's the thing about the bjp it needs this orator and an organizer from shyam prashad mukherjee dindyal upadhyay because it's both it's both a movement as well as a political party right the communists are like that and during the large period in which uh, communists were in power in west bengal you had jyoti basu who kind of you know head was the face of the government and you had pramod das gupta who was heading the who was sort of the the face of the person who spoke to the cadre and they were both equally powerful now unfortunately i haven't studied the personalities of these jugalbandis in detail but look it worked right and the fact that it worked tells me that it's not personality alone that makes the jugalbandi work it's the ideology of this you know this political idea that is both a movement as well as a party right but anyone here who want you know from bengal especially who wants to do you know who wants to write a book on that jugalbandi i'd be the first to read that i think it's a pretty valid point of understanding the real jugalbandi yeah uh anyone else uh, socialize uh uh so sinat uh, let me just answer this uh, until mohit gets his light back which is i think shrinath sridharan has asked is there any book that you wish that you had written before someone else had 
uh, no shortage, right? And uh, Srinath, forget books. There are no shortage of people I wish I had interviewed before people had. There are no shortage of people who are now talking to me, but who refuse to talk to me later, right? And I just realized this, that if I'm constant, you know, the, the enemy of a researcher is perfection, right? That's the enemy. If you're constantly in the business of looking at the last footnote before you start writing, reading the last book, doing the last interview, um, you know, going through the last manuscript, you'll never finish a book, right? So uh, I have a ton of regrets, but I just, at some point I say that, you know, the positives of, of starting writing and starting work is better than the, the possible regrets in doing it right now. So I have, there's no shortage, but if I let that limit me, there's no way I can write a book. And I think anyone else who produces is constantly sort of, you know, having to juggle the fact that what they're doing is not perfect versus let's start right now. Let's get on with the job. Right. Um, so, uh, um, Vinay, if I could just uh, you yeah. know, bring in the cricket analogy you used in the beginning yeah. about the Mahi playing, agreeing to yeah. play under uh, Virat Kohli, yeah. great results. Yeah. Uh, you know, in cricket, at least this is there that uh, the two World Cups India has won. Uh, Kapil Dev had uh, Gavaskar playing with him. Yeah. And likewise, uh, Mahi had uh, Sachin Tendulkar playing with him and famously you know, yeah. catapulted on shoulders of Harbhajan yeah. and others. So I think there is a lesson in uh, partnership at a larger level, not yeah. necessarily in the political domain. Where yeah, I yeah, think the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or uh, even, in, I, even in boardrooms, same. You know, the, Nehru, Nehru and Patel, uh, while they are much, uh, you know, there is, is enough literature pulling them apart. But you hear my friend Sandeep Bamza's uh, narrative on Princess Tan. The way Nehru and Patel have actually collaborated along with, in his argument, uh, Bamza's argument, uh, uh, Lord Mountbatten. But fundamentally, it couldn't have happened without any of those three characters not working very closely. And there was a time when uh, uh, Nehru wasn't the unquestioned leader vis-a-vis uh, uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel. So I think the burden of my song here is that as and when, uh, you know, uh, there is a impartial way in which uh, the better person comes forward, the, uh, the, the uh, seniority in the IS mode uh, doesn't, uh, you know, hold good anymore. And the country is the beneficiary. Yeah, no Fantastic. Fair. I'm really sorry for, for, for the slight technical. No hitch. problem, Mohit. We are answered one question, and I think now we're yeah. at Kasa Venkatesh Prasad. No, no, we are at the next one, Satya Vardi. So the uh, No, we, actually, I, I jumbled up. I, oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think we can take one last question now, um, which definitely um, uh, is part of your book. Um, uh, someone will have to actually go through your book in a detailed way. But still, for the sake of everyone who is here, I would uh, like to put this forward. Um, Bangaru Lakshman, right? Uh, Badru Dattera and Narendra are from backward caste and old city of Hyderabad, right? And you mentioned about uh, that how um, uh, at one point of time, BJP actually pulled the entire cause of one specific ideology that was Hinduism against um, uh, multiple caste system. And I think that's what even the 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 starting point of whatever happened in 1920s was the reason. And that's where the Muslim League also uh, got collated at the same time. Your views on that. But, uh, so you're saying that it, so let me, let, let me, ref, let me rephrase where I understand you. You're, it's a, the question is on Hyderabad or it's on, you know, OBCs and you know, which of those two? Letter, the, the, uh, the OBCs and uh, the entire Hindu caste system. No, a hundred percent. So I argue in the book, Mohit, as, as you've read, which is that Hindu nationalism is not, is different from traditional Hinduism. It's different, right? And it's self-consciously different because for Hindu nationalists, early Hindu nationalists, traditional Hinduism was a source of weakness. It was why Hindus got invaded more and more. Now, this was strikingly the case in the, case, uh, in the arguments of Savarkar, who wanted nothing to do with, with uh, Hindu culture. You know, he used to say cow is a useless animal yeah. because what he wanted was to make Hindus martial, right? To make Hindus strong again. And he saw that making them strong in an electoral context meant uh, a Hindu vote bank, right? That meant right from the beginning that Hindu nationalism reached out to lower castes, right? Now, it's, it's a pretty well-known fact that the RSS um, leaders have all been Maharashtrian Brahmins except I think for one Sarsanchalak Raju Bhaiya, right? But at the same time, the social base of voters of the BJP have changed. 
in the 2019 elections, you had OBCs, tribals, and Dalits voting for Modi more than they voted for anyone else, right? And that is not a coincidence. Within the DNA of Hindu nationalism itself, it was a break from traditional Hinduism in that it was progressive towards caste, right? On the other hand, traditional Hinduism was very um, inclusive of other religions. So there's this apocryphal story. It's an apocryphal story, which is that, you know, when Muslim traders from Arabia land in Kerala, the local Hindus helped them build a mosque. Right. Yeah. That's, very different from, Muslim, yeah. that's very different from the uh, BJP that is having anti love jihad laws. Right. What makes Modi so hard to beat is this mixture of being progressive towards other Hindus. Right. While being exclusive towards non Hindus. That's why if the opponents don't see this about the BJP, they'll never be able to beat it. Right. But in, in fact, you mentioned about the mosque this is the oldest monk. I think this is a sixth century or seventh century mosque. mosque which is still lies in Kerala. So very valid point. I think with this, we will have to um, um, uh, bring this session to an end, like all good things do come to an end. And um, I'm very, very thankful to, to Vinay, to Rohit and the entire Penguin team who helped us collate this discussion. And also uh, I'm thankful to get this book uh, free of cost, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Mohit, I'm very, I'm very grateful for you because you, know, you showed me your notes and the way you read it. Because when I do all this work, it's such a pleasure, you know, the, I, I, please show your readers the, the notes that you showed me. Uh, it's quite, uh, you know, it's really only, quite... Only, only if, they, if they think that writing too much on the book is not a good thing. No, uh, no, no, no. I, I really appreciate it. I, yeah, because, you know, the point of a book is not to sajaofy it in your, in your bookshelf in the drawing room. It's actually to make it dog-eared, make, make it actually use it, right? So thank you very much, Mohit. Um, thank you, Mr. Bansal. I really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vinay. Thank and you, I'm like uh, Mohit, uh, I paid for my book. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there I get I get my ten and a half percent there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, so the interesting part is, sir, though I got this book in free, but there are other books that I have to actually order by seeing the end notes. And that actually costs me a decent money, I must say. <laughs> but to all the listeners who tuned in today, and uh, we are very sorry for some questions that we can't take up today. But certainly we look for a half line discussion for sure. We'll circulate about the book in our book clubs as well. And we look forward to have a lot of people read the book and then uh, invite you, Mr. Um, Sitabati, for that. And that would be Thank really you very much. interesting. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohit. Yes, and Thank you. Ratri. More power Thank to you. And yeah, more power to you, Mohit, because you're, you're standing in opposition to history and you're yelling stop. And I think that's quite remarkable. Thank you. Fantastic. I take it as a compliment, yes. a great honor. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. See you all. Bye-bye.